Hello, and welcome to another Who's Who of Athanasia. I am your host, Jay Carter, and today we'll be talking about Belen, the Manted Alteration Mage. This is him right here. You can see him in the thumbnail. Belen is a Thrykreen. This miniature came from Dungeons and Dragons 2010, um, Thrykreen Mantis Warrior. And I am reimagining this guy as an alteration mage. So let's do it. If you'd like to follow along, uh, I can put a link maybe into this thing. Let's see if that's a thing that I can do. Nope, that lets me share it. That lets me change. Why would I not be able to access chat? Can I access chat? Is that a thing? Is that a thing? Are we are we are we doing this? I would love to access chat. I feel like I could access chat before. Why could I not access chat, access chat now? I have no idea. Well, bottom line, we're going to do this. If you're watching this live, I was not aware I could not put a link in chat. I would like to put a link in chat, but I cannot because I can't quite figure out how to make that happen. But in the meantime, if you are not watching this live, which is far more likely, uh, I'm going to put a link in chat to the character sheet for Bellin. It was randomly generated using the Grimoire random generator that you may have seen on some of my other videos. And we will be looking at that randomly generated character. We'll be making decisions about what exactly, why he is the way he is. We'll be discovering a little bit about the character together. Oh, I see that somebody's here. Hello. I can't see who you are, unfortunately. I would love to, but again, I can't see chat, which is just sad. Anyway, so we're gonna keep moving. Uh, I am able to see a character sheet. If you are not able to see a character sheet, I apologize. Uh, but I am, as I previously said, I would love to share it with you, but I can't figure out how to make that happen in chat. So in the meantime, I'm gonna describe it to you. So it's a basic character sheet, as you might've seen in some of my other videos. Right now we've got Belen, who is a, 20th level wizard, and I'm building them at 20th level to start so that I can depower them, so to speak. The random generator accounts for where a character ends up by the level that you set them at. So I can always depower somebody and I can say, you know, have these this many fewer spells, this many fewer ability score increases, this many fewer feats, but I can't always build up. And depending on where my party encounters them, I need to, may need to build up or down. Not all of these are going to be antagonists. So uh, I want to make sure that I can have them available to be uh, reliable either companions or maybe villains. Who knows? So what I'm looking at right now is a character sheet for Belen, a 20th level wizard with the sage background, male, and I'm going with a Simic hybrid uh, race. The reason I'm doing that is because Belen, our miniature, is a Thrykreen. And there really isn't any race that I've found so far that works really well for a, an insect character. Uh, they do, of course, have Thrykreen as a monster, but not as a playable race. So I'm looking in Guildmaster Guide to Ravnica. You may have seen this in the thumbnail. Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica has a race called the Simic Hybrid. And the Simic Hybrid has a number of different uh, features in it that I think are going to apply really well to Belen. So it comes with either a Manta Glide, Nimble Climber, or Underwater Adaptation at first level. This is perfect. We could either do a Manta Glide and just reskin that to like the kind of wings that come on a Mantis, or the one I've chosen is Nimble Climber. You have a climbing speed equal to your walking speed. And I feel like that sort of justifies his four arms. Like having four arms makes it easier to climb in my brain. So I'm going with a nimble climber. Plus I just think it's cool to like climb a wall and cast spells from up there. Like that makes it totally great. You can get out of the way of your barbarians and other people who want to take you down, right? You'll be vulnerable to ranged, but that's fine. At least it eliminates one of the problems. So Nibble Climber at first level. Then fifth level comes along, and you can choose one of the following. Grappling Appendages, a Carapace, or Acid Spit. Now, I don't see him as being somebody who spits acid. 
and grappling appendages, while appropriate, does not seem a very necessary for him as a wizard. So I'm going to go with Carapace. His skin in places is covered by thick shell. That's perfect. He's got an exoskeleton. He's a mantis. So you gain a plus one bonus to AC when you're not wearing heavy armor. Awesome. Now, on the character sheet, again, you'll be able to see this later when this stops being live. But on the character sheet, you'll see that we've got Elven Chain already loaded up in here. This came randomly. And this is because I give all of my characters randomly generated loot that makes sense for them. And I've split that up by class. So, you know, you're not going to end up with something that you can't use. You're going to end up with something that you can definitely use at your class. And this makes total sense because Elden Chain can be worn by anybody, even if they're not proficient in medium armor. This is one of the best things about Elven Chain. So it starts, number one, it's a chain shirt. So it starts at an AC of 14, but it also gets a miscellaneous bonus of one because it's magical or for whatever reason. I mean, you can call Elven Chain magical if you want to. But then of course, he also gets to add his dexterity bonus, which is already pretty sizable. He has a dex of 16, so he's got a modifier plus three. That makes him pretty high up there. Now, add to that then this carapace ability your skin in places is covered by a thick shell. You gain a plus one bonus to AC when you're not wearing heavy armor. He's not wearing heavy armor. He's wearing Elven Chain, which is a chain shirt, which is medium armor. So I'm going to go ahead and bump that miscellaneous plus one to a plus two. This now brings his AC up to a total of 19, which is amazing. Obviously, it's a 20th level wizard, but still, at whatever level he gets Elven Chain, boom, he's got a 19 AC. That's amazing. Uh, his other stats are as follows. We got Strength 8, Dex 16, Con 16, Intelligence 20, appropriate, Wisdom 10, Charisma 12. So he's actually pretty approach approachable. This is nice. He's neutral good. And let me see if there's any other items of note. He's got that 30-foot climbing speed, which is great. So let's get to his weapons. So I'm trying to conceptualize what this staff might be that he's got. And it looks like he's got a shuriken here as well. So we've got a clawed staff, and we've got a shuriken, and it doesn't look like he's got anything else. Now, not very common for your wizard to come, you know, quite so, I guess, diversely armed, but not outside of the realm of possibility. So we're going to go ahead and account for both of those. We're going to say that shuriken is definitely a ranged weapon. Uh, we'll call it a dagger, and that has a range of 2060. His attack bonus at 20th level is going to be pretty good because plus six proficiency bonus and then a plus three to dex. So that's a total of plus nine. That's nice. And then the damage is going to be a d4 plus three because finesse weapon, piercing damage. That's already pretty good. d4 plus three, pretty reliable uh, thrown weapon. Uh, now, in my campaign setting, I, or that is to say, one of the house rules I use is that if you're using daggers or some other similar, very small, like maybe a throwing knife or some, of some kind or a shuriken, that I feel that it's fair to say that if you use enough time preparing beforehand, if you're proficient with it, which like practically everybody is, and you have the time beforehand, you can load up your fingers with one per finger and then throw them all at the same time. And... Our Thrycreen here has only one, and I think that's actually kind of fair because on the mini, it doesn't show him having more than maybe two digits. So he's not gonna have he's not gonna have much more to hold on to those shurikens with other than the two digits. So I feel like having a shuriken available is, is fine. So let's go ahead and talk about that clawed staff. Now, you could easily just call this a quarter staff and call it good, but I really like the idea of having this thing deal piercing damage. And I don't feel like it's enough to say that he's wielding a quarter staff, but he's also like the only other option really to uh, available to wizards is going to be like a, like a spear, but they aren't proficient in spears. Wizards are proficient with, let's see if we have any piercing options. Anything that's maybe two handed versatile, perhaps daggers. No. Darts, no. Slings, no. Quarterstaffs, yes, but. And then light crossbows. Eh, that doesn't quite give me what I want. Now, the difference between a crossbow, not a crossbow, the difference between a staff, a quarterstaff, and a spear is you can throw a spear, and it deals piercing damage. And I think that's kind of the flavor I want to go for with this guy because he's got the, the little claws on the ends, right? And so I want to make it, make it deal piercing damage. Does he have to throw it? He probably won't. 
So you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and call it a quarter staff, but then I'm going to house rule that it's a quarter staff with that deals piercing damage. So it's a modified quarter staff. It's not going to break the game. It's fine. Clawed staff, quarter staff, no range increment. And then it's not great in his hands because he's got a minus one strength. His proficiency would still apply. So that's a plus six, but then minus one for strength. So it's a total plus five. That's respectable. And then his damage is going to be a D6 minus one because of the strength, and it deals piercing damage instead of blood and bludgeoning. I feel like that's fair to say. That's not going to that's not going to break anything. I feel like dealing piercing damage instead of bludgeoning damage, plus having the versatile. Like if you really wanted to like two hand that thing and really stab at somebody, sure. Yeah, why not? If he's in a position, ooh, and he's got the four arms, ooh, that makes that makes things interesting. So let's say if he's not climbing, I'm going to house rule that he can two hand because mantis because we haven't we haven't generated we haven't generated any stats i have not come up with any stats for a mantis race but in my head i'm like they got the four arms like surely you can pull off some somatic, somatic components with four arms and still have two arms available how would i how would i word that you can use your hands as arcing focuses nah i'm not going to worry about it meantime we'll just say that he can use at least two of his hands to use the versatile property of his quarterstaff. Sure, that's cool. That's what makes being a mantis fun. All right, so we've got all that figured out. So let's go down to our personality traits. So personality is verbose. <laughs> he's got an intelligence of 20, it makes sense. So he's verbose, lots of vocabulary, uses it frequently. His ideal is self-improvement. Okay, so he's looking hes looking to improve himself as much as possible, probably by cramming as much knowledge as he can in there. That makes sense. He's a sage. All this comes from sage anyway. His bond is guardian of knowledge. Okay, so he considers himself, like if there's a person or a document or a building that represents or, or contains uh, valuable knowledge, like he, that he considers it his personal like mission to protect that person or place or thing. Um, okay, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Flaw, loose lips. He says everything he learns, which can cause problems. All right, specialty, professor. That kind of makes sense actually, because as a teacher, I'm a teacher myself and I know that I love talking and this might be not be true of every teacher, but I feel like it's like, it's like the job of the teacher to impart information. Why would you not, if you know something, why would you not say it out loud so that everybody in the room can benefit from it? Oh no, that's got to get him into some trouble. So he's a professor. Okay, so let's, okay, let's, li let's link this with the guardian of knowledge thing then. So as a professor, you're going to be really attached. <gasps> Maybe he ran a guild. Maybe he was an archmage. Maybe he was a librarian. Maybe he was a librarian in a small town or a relatively small town. Maybe he was like the main dude. Maybe he was the guy who was trying to get, yeah, okay. Maybe he was the guy who was trying to inform, like like educate the, the, the town members. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's see where he would be, where he would be based out of. Okay. So if I randomly generate a town, let's see what comes up. All right. Fenelzir, F-E-N-E-L-Z-I apostrophe I-R, Fenelzir. All right, that's an appropriately named manted town. That sounds right. Uh, grassland, plains, mild and blustery weather clean and modern conditions appropriate for a library uh, alignment lawful good still good with his neutral good uh, alignment that's fine uh, it has plenty of cats and there are humans lizard folk loxodon goat folk and ant folk now i'm thinking we could probably just replace the ant folk with mantids so any ant folk could just be mantids so he's probably one of these ant folk in the in the major population 
uh, the, the major races of this pop of this of this town. Population 2062. Okay. My high school was to, I think it was about two, three thousand, maybe. I can't remember how many people were in there. So the size of my high school. So that's a relatively small town, actually. Uh, there is a town crier as the major feature of architecture. So the, like the town crier's uh, stump <laughs> or, or booth or gazebo or whatever, or, or board maybe, okay? Uh, there's an ore mine. Ooh, what kind of ore do they mine? There is a henge and they have a garden, like a gardens area as an attraction. Okay, this is interesting. So this seems very down to earth. It seems like, it seems like Velen is like trying to get these folk, I don't know, maybe to like lift themselves out of labor jobs, maybe. There's a mine, there's a gardens. Yeah, let's see what kind of businesses we've got. We've got an inn and chambers called the Fall Inn. Fall Inn, makes sense. Uh, that's run by a lizard folk. The general store is the Ore Mine General. Yeah, the Ore Mine's got to be big if they're naming things after it. Run by a human, human male. Uh, there's a mason called the Blazing Mason. A human female runs that. The gardener is the Languid Gardener. <laughs> I wonder why they call it the Languid Gardener, run by a human male. Okay. And then the potter is called the Twelfth Bullet. Hmm. Okay, run by a human female. Okay, so no no prominent mantids running the place, but it looks like, yeah, mason, gardener, potter, these people are very earthy. They're very, what can we do with our hands, making things, literally dealing with earth pretty much all the time. Okay, but it's clean and it's modern and probably due in no small part to Bellin's influence, I'm going to guess. So Bellin runs a library at this place. He sets himself up as a professor, probably just teaching everything. Yeah, because if it's only a population of 2062, maybe he just teaches everyone everything. And so, oh, guardian of knowledge. What if his library burnt down? And so he feels very protective. Yeah, as a 20th level character, you're going to end up developing a lot of like, yeah, a lot of a lot of thoughts and feelings about your experiences by then. So maybe he maybe he's maybe he's trying to rebuild. Ooh, yes, and that's why it's all very important. So he's got to track down the people in the books, and maybe even um, another building, or at least the means to to build another building. So he's he's the Fenelzir librarian. And then also, if there are any mages nearby, so he doesn't run an actual guild. He doesn't run an actual guild, but he knows a lot about alteration magic. So maybe he teaches alteration magic to any mages who come by. Uh, he's neutral good, so it doesn't look like he's he's not. No, we're calling him we're calling him a guild mage. So maybe he is. Maybe he graduated from the academy, came to this small town, Fenelzir, because maybe this is where he came from. Like he, yes. So he came from Fenelzir to another town to learn magic, came back and said, hey, I want to I wanna teach everybody else too. So he's not running his own guild. It's not sanctioned or anything. But definitely he's like, hey, I want to attract more attention to this, to this thing, to this thing that I do. Yes. Cool. Okay. So he's an alteration professor in his one-room schoolhouse in the Fenelzir library, which has been burned down, but let's say has been at least rebuilt. Maybe, ooh, Oh, that sounds amazing. What if he what if he uses the town crier's gazebo and he's got just like one little bookshelf and he's been rebuilding it this whole time? Oh, that's so precious. Yes, he's just rebuilding his library one book at a time. And so he's always looking for people to like, oh, that's great. That's great. So if the PCs come to town in the Fennel's ear and they meet this guy, they're going to be like, hey, we got some books. And he's like, oh, thank you. Good. <laughs> I'll buy them from you right now. How much do you want? Let's do this, right? So he's going to be looking for books. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what other information we have about him. Um, simple gear. He's got a wand, a spell book, a scholar's pack, a dagger, light crossbow. He's wearing cloister robes. Uh, he has a writing kit, a borrowed book on perception that will aid in perception. Good. He's got a draft horse. 
Okay. Uh, he's wearing the elven chain. He has a scroll of alter self appropriately because he's an alteration mage. Makes sense. He's wearing boots of the winterlands. Nice. Okay. So maybe he lives uh, in the north. It did say, what was the town specs? What did it say? Mild and blustery. Okay. So northern, where it snows sometimes. Sure, that makes sense. He has a staff of fire. What? No, yes. Suddenly we've discovered what the staff is. Ah, oh, that's cool. So it's not just a clawed staff, per se. This is a staff of fire that looks like a staff that is clawed. That's cool. Let me see what the staff of fire does. Let's see if uh, d, d Beyond has it. Staff fire. I say, of course it has it, but I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't pay for it. I use the free version. So let me see if they've just included it as an option. Yes, they do. Interesting. Okay. So this requires attunement. It's very rare. Oh, nice. You have fire, you have resistance to fire damage while you hold the staff. Okay. It has 10 charges. While holding it, you can use an action to expend one or more of its charges and cast one of the following spells from it using your spell save DC. Burning hands, fireball, wall of fire. The staff gains a D6 plus four expended charges daily at dawn. If you expend the last charge, usual stuff. Okay, cool. Yeah, actually, <laughs> and the picture, if you look on D&D Beyond, the picture actually does have not claws per se, but like you can see this like formation of like two kind of prongs on the top and then a pair of smaller prongs on the bottom. This is perfect. Thematically appropriate. Yes. <gasps> What if he feels guilty because he burned down his own library? Oh my gosh, as a very rare magical item, he would have gotten it relatively late in the game. So it wouldn't have, he wouldn't have had it. Oh, oh, what if he got in really good with the one of his professors and they gifted it to him or no, let's say he was charged. Here we go. He was charged with delivering this thing. He was supposed to give it to the, the, the former librarian. Maybe the librarian was a cohort. Maybe he was the one who got Bellin interested in alteration in the first place. And the guild master of the alteration guild back where he learned his stuff was like, hey, I've got this thing. Now that you graduated, your last job I'm going to give you, your, your parting... Uh, sort of responsibility to the guild, to the alteration guild, is I want you to go and deliver this staff of fire to so-and-so at the library in, what did we call it? Fenelzir. And so he goes to Fenelzir and some accident occurs. <sighs> yeah, we'll leave it there. Who knows? Some accident occurs. He misuses the staff. He Maybe he gets curious and uses it. We don't know. His wisdom is 10, so that kind of tracks. He's not super, yeah, he, he doesn't have a lot of sense. So he's intelligent. He knows how it works, and he's curious. He's all about self-improvement, yes. So he's sitting there playing with the Staff of Fire, waiting for the librarian to show up, and come to find out he knows, he understands how to use it, and he uses it, and he burns the place down. Oh, and he's got that on his conscience for the rest of his life, which is why he dedicates himself to this library and this, he didn't come from Fennel's ear. Or if he did, like he he hasn't lived there for most of his life or something, maybe not. Maybe he really is just like, he's got the guilt complex and he's like, oh, I burned down this. Oh. Yeah, and now he's got the staff of fire and he's hanging on to it because he doesn't want it to fall in anybody else's hands. And he wants, he wants to like, it's like part of his own, like he needs to prove himself. He needs to prove to himself that he is responsible for this staff. So he's gonna hang on to it. Nice, okay, good. So we've got that. He's got a Staff of Fire. Amazing. That just added a lot to his character. Great. Potion of Superior Healing. Tracks. Boots of False Tracks. Okay. Why would he have Boots of False Tracks? He's not going to be wearing them all the time. Well, oh, here's an interesting thing. So as a Mantid, he hasn't got what you would call human-like feet. He is a humanoid, but you can easily tell that he's an insect if he's walking around in his bare feet. So what if he wears the boots of false tracks to make his tracks appear human? Yeah. Why does he want to do that? Or to appear like some other race? Huh. I'll have to think about that. We'll come back to that. All right. So he's proficient with the wizard weapons, no armor or shields. 
Um, he has his animal enhancements by virtue of being uh, a Simic hybrid, but we're just saying that those are the natural extensions of who he is as a mantid. Uh, he has no resistances or immunities on, by virtue of being a wizard. He's got cold resistance due to having his boots of the Winterlands, and he has fire resistance due to his staff. Nice, so resistance to both cold and fire. Well done. His languages, he knows common, and this says he knows Vidalcan because the original concept of the Simic hybrid was that they were either modified Vidalcans or elves, but we're not gonna put that there. Instead, Vidalcan, we're gonna replace with Mantid. He knows the language of, of the Mantis people. He also knows giant, undercommon, orc, celestial, and dwarvish. Okay, cool. So far, so good. Okay, he's 83 years old out of 98 max for a Mantid. Okay, I can get behind that. He's five foot four. Sure, why not? 126 pounds. His eyes are dark blue. Mm. This is all based on the Simic hybrid stats. So maybe I'll change that to just say, what color are Mantis eyes? Mantis eye, well, they're pretty, Consistently green, ooh, although, ooh, there are some purple-eyed mantises? That's cool. You know what? I'm convinced. The cool factor, uh, purple faceted eyes. It also says he's got violet skin. Again, that's from being like Vidalcan. Eh, this mini is pretty clear. He's more like a, like a tan or like a savanna color. Hmm. I don't want to say tan. He's sort of a yellowish. Yellow tan. Cool. Hair none. Makes sense. Mantis. All right. His racial traits. Animal enhancement, limb, nibble climber, and carapace. We've got that figured out. Sage feature, library access, the clo cloistered scholar version. Uh, you can access your library's common archives and more likely to be allowed access to the restricted section. He's the freaking librarian, so of course he would be. You know your library's personnel and can navigate its bureaucracy. Other libraries offer you preferential treatment as your professional, as a professional courtesy. Yeah, that makes total sense. He literally runs the library, so why would he not? He worships Melora, but we kind of don't worry about that kind of thing. The concept of who a character worships in my campaign setting is probably a lot less important because there, there's really only two like deity deities and that's the light and the dark. So the idea of worshiping Melora would probably just be the result of like the, the flavor of his attitude. If he is religious, what sorts of things is he, uh, does, does he care about? And, I don't really know that he is necessarily religious, so I'm not worried about that just now. He is the transmutation wizard archetype. Now, I have aligned, so this is a bit of an explanation. The spheres of power system comes with 20 spheres. And those spheres are a reimagination of the usual schools of magic. So instead of having evocation, illusion, necromancy, um, transmutation, conjuration, evocation, all that stuff, instead of all those schools, we have these. So, but because this is a Pathfinder supplement and they, I've, I've backed the Spheres of Power uh, conversion to fifth edition, but I don't have it yet. So I'm doing what I can with what I've got. Uh, I'm deciding that the alteration sphere is at least related enough to the transmutation school that it makes sense. So we're gonna say transmutation and let's see what his spells look like. So we've got <clears throat> cantrips, at will, gust, message, mold earth, mending, and shape water. Shape water makes sense. He wants to put those fires out. Ninth level spell slots. He's got one. He knows two spells. True polymorph and time stop. True, poly True polymorph makes sense because he's an alteration mage. He's done his research. He's extended his knowledge. He understands how those uh, spells work. Now, another detail in my campaign setting is that there are no 
how to say this. There are no universal spells past sixth level. So seventh, eighth, and ninth level spells are, are, are all either invented by the people who know them or they are learned by somebody that person knows. But they are not taught as a rule, which means that in order to actually learn a seventh, eighth, or ninth level spell, you have to go looking for it or invent it yourself, which as my players are finding out in our current campaign is very difficult and sometimes ends very badly. So, but this is a double-edged sword. This means that the villains aren't gonna have access to those spells either, or if they do, then it's a really good thing if you take them down because then you can steal their grimoire and learn their stuff that nobody else would have available. So you suddenly get this really precious resource. This is a, a, a couple of things on my part trying to sort of modify the way that my world works. I like the idea that magic is new, but people's understanding of it has been advanced quite a bit by the essentially extraterrestrials who came and visited them at the very beginning. That makes them sound like aliens, but it's more like they're eldritch beings from another creation who uh, are like older than time and have come and basically said, look, all of you animals, let's elevate you from your uh, non, I mean, I guess they were, they were sentient, but like from, from your non-humanoid state and let's make you into these. So like alteration magic was kind of the first magic that was taught on Athanasia. Um, it was what made all the animals into either human-animal hybrids or into straight-up humans. Uh, so the mantids, just like every other insect race or animal race or anything race, uh, were are, are the descendants of the first animals, the first mantis, for example, that was helped by the strangers in becoming humanoid. So that's an interesting kind of thought. Like maybe he went into being an alteration mage because he knows about that history and thought, you know, I really want to understand what that secret is that helps animals change into other animals or whatever. And so that was part of his interest. I don't know. I'm not sure where I was going with that, but there it is, lore. He's also got time stop. Right, so the, so the spells that you know because, because magic is young on the planet, you don't have all of these advanced magical discoveries. Um, it is taught on like a first level spell sort of basis in academies. Like any first level mage is gonna have access to those first level spells. Once you become a guild mage, you start specializing, becoming a little bit more developed. And then like arch mages are straight up, not even a thing until level 10. Like if you become a level 10 wizard, basically, you you have the enough gumption to become an archmage. So nobody would really even know seventh, eighth, or ninth level spells until, unless you were like a wizard, one of the three wizards in the world, or a wizard appointed by one of those wizards. So this is like a very rare thing. So I'm just assuming that at this point he's become so advanced that maybe he maybe he even is at 20th level anyway, maybe he even is like a like a an appointed wizard, a named wizard. Uh, eighth level, control weather. Seventh level, etherealness and sequester. Interesting. Ooh, sequester could be like he's trying to uh, hide away the the knowledge, right? Guardian of knowledge thing to, to keep it away from harm. Okay, interesting. Control weather could be also to like call down a rainstorm if something terrible happens and he wants to put out the fire. I'm feeling a lot, I'm really leaning into this thing because I feel like this is a very dramatic moment for him in his life to have like want, wanted to fulfill his responsibilities by like delivering the staff, but also just screwed up royally and, and wanted to wanted to make up for it. So like he's, he's, he's developing ways to make sure that it never happens again. Uh, six level spells, Investiture of Stone, Flesh to Stone, Investiture of Wind, interesting. Uh, fifth level, Skill Empowerment, Telekinesis, Control Winds, Transmute Rock, all right. Uh, fabricate, Polymorph, Control Weather, mm-hmm. Okay, a little bit of creation in there. Not Control Weather, Control Water, right, again, because putting things out. Fly. There's your fly, right? He doesn't need the, the gliding wings feature from the Simic hybrid race. He can just have the fly spell. And a lot of times I like the idea of giving 
like explaining magic or magical items for a character in other ways. Like rather than just saying, oh yeah, you find some slippers of spider climb and you put them on and you can climb walls. Instead, maybe I award them this magic item in the form of like a character feature. So instead of saying you have slippers of spider climb, maybe I just say you as a man to develop the ability to climb walls. That's just a thing you can do now. Uh, that's what one of the characters who actually just <laughs> departed the party from our current campaign in Tales of Athanasia, uh, she was a Winsley. And she is, the Winsleys are spider trees. And so when she was like, yeah, can I have slippers of spider climb? I was like, yes, but on the condition that you accept it as a feature of you rather than like a magic item. Because I think that's way cooler. I think it's cooler to say that your character just happens to develop this thing that you can do. So as per the fly spell, in my mind, I'm going to say that, yes, well, it is a spell and it functions using a spell slot. What actually happens as far as the character is concerned, because the mechanics do what they do. That's fine. But like using up this resource, whatever it is, you then fly. And so I want to say that this fly spell represents Belen's ability to then like unfurl the mantis wings and use them. That they, the mantis wings have always been there, let's say, but they uh, are momentarily imbued with a certain amount of vitality and strength that allows him to use them effectively in flight for whatever period of time, right? So there's that. Uh, haste, water breathing, sure. Enlarge, reduce, ooh, that's fun. Maybe he enlarges other mantises and maybe rides them around or something, that's cool. Pyrotechnics, I don't know why he would take pyrotechnics. Ooh, this is a second level spell. Maybe this was the beginning. Yeah, I don't think he has any fire-based spells after this. Yes, okay, so here's more story. So there he is, second level spell, pyrotechnics. He's got the ability to make fire and he's very flashy with it because pyrotechnics is not just like firebolt. No, it's like explosions and things that look flashy and cool. So let's say he, at whenever he got that second level spell, he was like, ah, da 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 da. And he was really good with it, right? And that's when his archmage came to him and said, look, you, you're pretty good with this fire stuff. Uh, tell you what, I'll, you know, you're, you're ready to go. Let's, let me, let me give you this, this flame staff, this fire staff, because I really, I really feel like you'll get a kick out of it, but don't play with it. Go deliver it to the library and have him teach you how to use it and, and have fun. But he gets, that's when he gets a little bit antsy and he's like, antsy, mantisy. And he's like, no, mm, I kind of want to figure this out on my own because self-improvement. And so he does. And that's when all of this stuff crap hits the fan. So after that pyrotechnics, he never takes another fire spell. Never. That's the, that's the tipping point. That's it. That's when he makes his mistake. Second level spells. What level is that? When does a wizard get second level spells? Uh, third level. So he's a third level wizard. He has just learned pyrotechnics. And yeah, he takes it a little bit too far. Cool. All right. First level spells, expeditious retreat, jump. Maybe that's an early version of fly. Maybe he's putting a little bit of magic juice into trying to get those wings to really do what he wants. And then feather fall. This is also good. So he's actually altering his own body. He's saying, look, it existed in my ancestors. I want to be able to do this. And so he's like, all right, first level, I'm, I'm developing my jump capabilities and I'm letting my wings be a thing that helped me to, uh, to, to go farther. And then feather fall, he's able to say, okay, these wings are going to help me sort of float to the ground. Okay. And then finally at third level, he gets the fly spell and he figures out how to really strengthen his wings so that he can fly. That's cool. All right, Arcane Recovery, Wizard Characteristic, once per day, he finishes a short rest and recovers 10 levels of spells, uh, spell slots up to fifth level. That's a thing that all wizards can do. Transmutation. So he gets the Transmutation Savant. Uh, copying a Transmutation spell costs half. Minor Alchemy, he transmutes an object made of no more than X cubic feet of wood, stone, Iron copper into another of those materials makes sense. He's all about the transmutation, the alteration. 
Transmuter's Stone. Uh, it grants one of the following to the bearer, Dark Vision. That's why he's got the Dark Vision, I bet. Or if not, is it just a feature of, is it just a feature of Simic hybrids? Is that just a thing they can do? How does that work? Because if not, he'll put his transmuter stone to different. Yes, the Simic hybrids automatically get dark vision. And following what we're talking about here, the flavor is he's a mantis. Sure, I'd say, yeah, he's got faceted eyes. Of course, he can see in the dark. Why not? So he would probably use his transmuter stone for something else. So it would either increase his speed while unencumbered, give him proficiency in con saves, resistance to acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder, choose one. And he's already got those boots of the Winterlands and his staff of lightning, both of which give him resistance to cold and fire. So maybe he's going to resist acid, lightning, or thunder. That's interesting. Yeah. Maybe not proficiency in con saves. I don't think that's entirely necessary. And his speed... I don't think speed has ever been an issue for him because he's got those like jump and fly spells and things. He's maneuverable all over the battlefield. So I don't think that's it. He probably just has resistance like acid or lightning or thunder. He's got some weather spells. So maybe it'll be like lightning or thunder. Control weather. I bet control weather, eighth level, you can probably pull down some, some lightning bolts. Maybe he's got, uh, yeah, we'll make a little note. We'll make a little note. We'll say in his, in his gear, Magic items, we're going to say transmuter stone. Um, resist electricity. Sure. And then in his resistances, we will also say electricity. No, not, sorry, electricity. Lightning. That's how, that, that's how they flavored it. Lightning, and then that comes from the transmuter stone. That's a thing. Lightning. Okay. So that's fun. All right. There's the transmuter stone. Okay. He can cast a first level spell, change the effect of the transmuter stone. That's fine. Master transmuter uses an action and destroys his stone. And he gets one of the following. Major transformation. 10 minutes and... Handling one non-magical object of up to five feet cubed or less, transform the object into another equivalent size and mass of equal or lesser value. That's interesting. I don't know what he would use that for necessarily. Uh, Panacea, touch an ally with your stone, remove all curses, diseases, and poisons from the ally. That ally regains all HP. Restore life, touch a dead ally with your stone, cast raise dead on that ally. Restore youth, touch an ally with your stone. Ally's age is visibly reduced by 3 to 10 years. To as low as 13 years, lifespan is unchanged. Okay. I don't see him using that restore youth thing, but restoring life, I think, would be very valuable. Yes. Yes. He would definitely use restore life because if he's, again, going back to that guardian of knowledge thing, he's probably going to use that to save someone that he feels like is an an irreplaceable asset so that he doesn't get in the same scenario scenario he did before where that librarian died because he left because he lit the library on fire so he's saving that thing just in case he needs to save another librarian uh melora forbid shape changer add polymorph to your spell book and cast it without expending a spell slot that's where he got polymorph from Yes, Master Transmuter, you transmute uh, your new Transmuter Stone options. Right, so he's got that. That gives him more options. Got it. Spell Mastery, eight hours. Choose one first level and one second level spell in your spell book uh, until you use this ability again. Cast either of those spells at will at its lowest level. So the signature spells are Fly and Haste. Fly, of course he's got Fly because he likes the idea of altering his body to match the capabilities of his ancestors with the wings. And then Haste. And I can see that being a thing where he's like, look, if something goes horribly wrong, I want to be able to act quick enough that I can that I can fix it before anything terrible happens. I feel like I'm harping on this one moment a lot, but this is probably like the defining moment in his life. And to be fair, if the PCs ever encounter him, they're not going to have a whole lot of time to get into a lot of backstory. So probably having this one event be like the thing. That's probably all the PCs are going to ever need to know about him, really. 
any more any character development past that is just going to be like okay i mean we have other stuff to do so we gotta go so yeah i think that's fair i think it's fair Feats, keen mind, always know north hours before sunrise or sunset and anything seen or heard in the past month. Yep, guardian of knowledge. He's got to remember stuff. Linguist, he can create ciphers. Guardian of knowledge, makes sense. Observant, read lips. I think you probably just would have picked that up for the sake of the fun of it. Like he's self-improvement. Like if, if I can know what other people are saying from far away, that's amazing. Sure, why not? Uh, lightly armored, light armor proficiency, it's not built in. That's fine. Probably he was building up to that chain shirt. I imagine he probably thought about his own limitations as far, like his ability to alter his body probably revealed to him the limitations of whether or not, of, of how much he could really protect himself. Now, I'm sure there's other things like bark skin and stuff like that. But probably he just felt like, look, I've got other things to do. I've got some utility to get out of my spells. I don't have time for that mess. And so he probably like developed a, uh, a proficiency in light armor to kind of say, look, I'm going to focus my attention elsewhere. I need to develop some light armor proficiency to, to the sake of just being a little bit more armored and keep myself alive. So there, that sounds good. Skulker, miss a foe with a ranged attack while hidden. Stealth is not broken, make stealth checks while lightly obscured, perception checks in dim light, not at disadvantage. Hmm, this might have something to do with that dark vision he's got. Maybe he is, hmm, maybe that was one of the first feats he took. Maybe earlier in life he was he was a little more sneaky. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe he he tried to, to linger in places he shouldn't. Maybe this is why he was trying to mess with that staff. This is sort of part of an attitude of his where because of his because of his self-improvement, his curiosity can get the better of him, but also it lends him some abilities that yeah, that are that are kind of fun. Okay. So if he misses a foe with a ranged attack while hidden, so he's gonna throw his shurikens from from stealth. And he's got he's got a solid dex. He's got a plus three dex. Like that's not nothing. Let's see what his stealth score is. Stealth is three. Yeah, he's not proficient in it, but pff, still, it's not nothing. That's kind of interesting. So maybe he was a maybe he was sort of a sneaker. Maybe he was sort of a, a stinker and did did some mischievous things. All right, cool. Making stealth checks while lightly obscured. Sure, yeah, he was sneaky in his youth. Okay. All right, let's see about the last bit here. So his adventurer acquaintance. He knows a male kobold named Slash, who is a seventh level paladin. Chaotic evil. Interesting. Why would he have why would he have known a chaotic evil male cult? Oh, of course. Because of his earlier days. He's neutral good now, but he wasn't always. Maybe he was chaotic good, or maybe chaotic neutral at one point, and he kind of fell in with the wrong crowd. <gasps> maybe it was Slash. Oh, maybe Slash was the bad influence. Maybe he dared him and he was like, hey. You should totally just just try it. See what it does. Figure it out. Ooh, interesting. Okay, so now we go on to the biography. It says, I was born in the home of a family friend, and I have two siblings. I am the youngest. Okay, so this family friend might have lived in, again, Fennelzir. Maybe the family friend was in Fennelzir. That's where he was. Okay. He has two siblings. He's the youngest. He knows who his parents are. He says, I was raised by both my mother and my father. We lived in a modest lifestyle in a wilderness village. That seems to track because Fennelzir is totally a mine and it's got gardens and it's got like a potter so that you know there must be a lot of like either clay or mud nearby. Yeah, for sure. Lived a modest lifestyle in a wilderness village. Yeah. I remember having a large circle of friends. Okay, so he was <gasps> among whom is this male kobold, this Slash character. Mm. When I was 18, I married my partner. Oh, nice. Okay. Eight years later, an adventurer and I became enemies. Oh, the rift was my doing. Eight years later, 18 plus eight, 26. So 26 years old, he's he's a third level mage. He's got pyrotechnics and he's in, in, entrusted with this responsibility to deliver this fire staff to a librarian in Fennelzir, coming back home. 
Huh. Huh. He knows this guy Slash from somewhere. And Slash is like, hey, mess with the staff. And he's like, mm, okay. And he sees what happens. And then he swears this guy off. He's like, you did this. I never should have listened to you. You're a bad influence. And he just said, that's it. We're done. Okay. When I was 40, I had my first child. Oh, so he's got kids. Okay. Eight years after that, I did some work for a friendly cook. I still have six gold pieces saved up from it. Oh, that's nice. Um, when I was 67, I stole from someone's home and I was nearly caught in the act. He's a sneaky little devil and sometimes it catches up with him. He still got that streak. He stole something from someone's home and he was nearly caught in the act. What was it? I had to flee and I'm still wanted by the authorities where I committed the crime. <gasps> where did he commit the crime? 12 years later, Friendly Adventurer gifted me a potion of healing. Well, Slash is definitely not that adventurer. Okay. He had to flee. Maybe. Mm, mm. Okay. Let's think about this, right? So he's trying to steal something, but when it's when he's 67, right? He was third level at age 26. He had to have been higher level by then. So he tried to steal something from someone's home. Let's say he discovered that way back in the day when the library burned down, there was somebody who had borrowed a book and taken it to another town. When they did, and they discovered that the library had burned down, uh, of course, there was nobody to follow up and say, hey, return our book. So, Guardian of Knowledge, Bellin comes in and he's like, hey, that book belongs in our library. And of course, whoever it was was like, mm, what do you mean? What library? Hmm. And so, he's like, okay. Fair point. Neutral good. He's going to try and, even if it's outside of the law, he's willing to do it. So he's like, okay, fine. You don't want to return the book? All right. See you later. And he comes back at night. Of course, left over from his days when he was hanging out, that male kobold slash, what a jerk. And so he comes in and he tries to steal it from the dude's house. And so... It says, I stole from someone's home. And so he legit got that book back. He got it back. And it says, I had to flee and I'm still wanted by the authorities where I committed the crime. So they, they, they saw that it was him. They about caught him. And now he's got that book and he's just like, mm. 12 years later, a friendly adventurer gifted me a potion of healing. Maybe that's one of the PCs. One of the PCs gifted him a potion of healing. I don't know. He says, I use polysyllabic words that convey the impression of great erudition. The goal of life, the goal of a life of study is the betterment of oneself. I have an ancient text that holds terrible secrets that must not fall into the wrong hands. That's it. That's the book. That's the book he stole back. I have an ancient text that holds terrible secrets that must not fall into the wrong hands. <gasps> I can't keep a secret to save my life. Oh, that's a problem. Or anyone else's. Yeah. Yep. Nope. I taught in a university scriptorium or monastery on a subject of personal interest. So I'm going to say, I'm going to change this. I taught in a library. And I'm going to change uh, on a subject of personal interest to I taught alteration. And I'm going to change it to the present tense. I teach alteration in the town library. There. Nice. I grew up listening to tales of great wizards, and I knew I wanted to follow their path, so there, that's the motivation. I grew up listening to tales. Who would have told them those tales? That library would have. That librarian would have. I strove to be accepted in an academy of magic and succeeded. He did end that. For this reason, I became a wizard. Yep. Okay. That wraps it up. So here's Bellin, ladies and gentlemen. Bellin, the Mantid Wizard, the Mantid Alteration Mage. Bellin, he's a good kid. He was a good kid growing up. He uh, and his two siblings, I think. Two siblings? Yeah. He and his two siblings grew up in the home of a family friend. 
in a little town called Fennelzir, out in the grasslands. There was a, a, a mine, a mason, a gardener, and a potter. He grew up among all these very simple things. And he knew that while that was something to be respected, that there was something more to life. Often he would visit the librarian of Fennelzir, who at the time had a respectable library for the size of the town. And it was from that librarian that he heard tales of wizardry and magic. And he thought to himself, I need to figure, I need, I need to learn this. I need to do something interesting along these lines. And so he was like, okay, I'm going to go where, where librarian, where would I find um, someone who could teach me this? And the librarian was like, well, you just go over here to this neighboring city and they've got an academy there and they can teach you. And they even have an alteration guild. And wouldn't that be interesting? So we start learning about history from this librarian. And he's like, yeah, 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 this is good. This is good. And he learns about the, um, he reads, mm, here you go. He reads the original tales, the poems, the epic poems about when the strangers came to Athanasia and taught the animals how to change their shapes. And he thought, I, I gotta learn how to do this. This is amazing. Yes, absolutely. So he goes to this neighboring town. He grows up in this, in this academy setting and not a member of the academy, but just some other little lizard dude comes along named Slash. And this lizard kid is just a bad influence on him. And he's never been exposed to this kind of stuff in his life. But he teaches this, this kid Slash, this kobold, this little lizard dude Slash, teaches Bellin how to skulk around and he teaches him how to be sneaky and he teaches him to like, you know, throw these shuriken or whatever. And he's like, yeah, 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 this is, great. this is great, cool. And he tries to fit in, but it comes around and bites him. Because even after he graduates from the academy and he goes and joins the Alteration Guild, he and Slash stay friends. But it's that last moment when the Alteration Guild uh, Archmage says, hey, look, I've got a responsibility for you. You've done very well. I can see that you are talented with fire and I've got something that might interest you. I want you to grow into it though. I want you to take this staff, take it to the librarian in uh, Fennel's ear and have him teach you how to use it. One day, when he feels that you're ready, I will give him instructions to let you keep it. It'll be yours, but you have to let him teach you how to use it. And he says, yeah, you got it. So he goes back home to Fennel's ear. Slash goes with him and he's like, hey, I'm headed out, I'm about to become a paladin. But before I take my vows, I just wanna have one last hurrah. Let me come with you. So Bellin, of course, is like, yeah, sure, why not, right? Gets to the librarian, uh, gets to the library in Fennel's ear, and they're just waiting forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. He's helping some other client, whatever it is. Maybe there's this moment where he sees a client borrowing this book. And it's this really old looking ancient, like decorated tome. Maybe this is where he read about those ep epic poems of the strangers arriving, that it was in that book. And he was like, oh, I recognize that book. And he sees the face of the dude, he leaves. But while the librarian is busy, he comes back and he's like, oh yeah, sorry, I was helping a client. Look, I gotta take care of something real quick. I'll just, I'll, I'll be a moment. Just stay here, don't touch anything. I'll be right back. Librarian leaves. So he and Slash are just chilling out. And Slash starts looking at books, getting bored, throwing things around. And Balan starts to take this a little bit personally. And he's like, hey, dude, come on. Look, I, I grew up here. Like, have a little respect, man. What's, what's the deal? And so finally Slash is just like, whatever. You don't need these guys. You could figure out how to use that staff on your, on your own. He's like, yeah, but... I'm supposed to have the librarian teach me how to use it. And he's like, don't worry about that, man. You know enough, you could figure this out. He's like, well, probably, yeah, but still, 
you know, and he's neutral. So he's not like necessarily into this whole, you know, law abiding citizen necessarily thing. And so probably it just took a little bit of like, you know, slash egging him on. And finally he was like, okay, cool. No, I'll, I'll try it. I'll try it. I'll give it a shot. And so he sits there and tries to figure out how to get the, the staff to work. By accident, it goes off. And there he is in the library. And he accidentally lights the place on fire. Slash bolts, gets out of there. And he's like, hey, no, help me. Like, go get some water from the well and help me like put this out. And he's like, no, dude, I'm not gonna die. Screw that, just leave this place behind, come with me. And he's like, no, no, I can't do that. Like, he's still good, right? He's neutral good, but he's still good. It's like, okay, all right, fine, look, just go get the water, come back, leave it outside the building, just help me, okay, just help me. He's like, hey, fine. Chaotic evil slash bolts. He leaves, he never comes back. And at that moment, when he realizes what happened as he's looking at the burning rubble of the library, he's like, that's it, we're done. Slash and I are done. If I ever see that guy again, I am going to burn him alive with this staff. Anyway, time goes on. The librarian, of course, is dead. And so he takes it upon himself, Bellin does, to rebuild that library. He salvages whatever he can, puts it on a little shelf, puts it in the town crier's booth. And he just says, look, I need a place to leave this stuff until we can get enough to rebuild this library. And it's been like that ever since. He's just been making do and getting by and just trying his best to be like, I really want to teach you guys alteration magic, but I know what I did and I know I feel horrible about it, okay? But like, you gotta understand, I'm doing my best here. Like I'm trying to make up for what I did. And that's why he ends up learning all those water spells, you know, control water, uh, shape water, maybe even time stop. He's got haste and time stop because he's like, look, if this ever happens again, like I wanna know that I can fix it. So he continues to learn, he continues to advance his alteration skills. And that's where the PCs find him, hanging out, running a library out of the town crier's gazebo in Fennelzir, asking for books. Oh, that was the last thing. Maybe that's the adventure. Maybe the adventure is, hey, look, I just discovered I just now tracked down who this guy was that borrowed a book from the librarian and I got to get it back. And so maybe this is the moment. This is the quest where he's like, please help me go to this guy's house. Help me steal it back. He will not let me buy it from him. He believes that he doesn't, he, he doesn't owe it back to the library because the library is burned down now, even though I've got the library here, but he doesn't agree, but whatever. Please help me. Please help me go. This book is important. This book has a lot of valuable information. It holds terrible secrets that must not fall into the wrong hands because he's only just now realized, he's just now realized what through, like going through like the inventory of the library, what's missing. This was burned, this was burned, this was burned. This book is still gone. And that was the most important book. And it's got secrets that can't fall into the wrong hands. Please, adventurers, help me to track this book down. And his plan, his plan is, I just need you to keep the authorities off my tail. I will steal it but I just need you to get the authorities off my tail long enough for me to do that. And then we'll, we'll be out and I will pay you whatever you want. Spells, knowledge, whatever. So there it is. There is our story for Bellin, the Manted Alteration Mage. And I hope you guys join me for the next one. It's about an hour. Well, we'll try to keep it within an hour next time. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Who's Who in Athanasia with your host, Jay Carter. Have a pleasant day.